Thanks, that's Dr. Zhang Gi, our director at Gilead Healing Center. And uh, again, I hope you are able to join us for these 21 days of prayer and fasting. And I had somebody come up to me last week and said, well, I didn't get in at January 1st. Can I still jump in? Yeah, absolutely you can. I encourage you to jump in. Let's fast until January 21st, January 22nd. We're going to have an amazing prayer gathering here. And I'm asking that everybody participate in some way. And then everybody come on the 22nd. We're going to pray together. I would like all of you to be here. And I know there are churches from all over the community that are going to join us as well. It will be a powerful time to end our fasting this year. So looking forward to that. Hey, let's pray. God, thank you for the privilege we have to gather and worship And Lord, I ask that in the next few moments we have together, that God, you'd come visit with us, speak to us. God, give us ears to hear what your Holy Spirit has to say. God, work something grand from your kingdom on the inside of us on this day. And I pray again, Lord, that miracles will be released into the lives of every person. God, I ask it and I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, amen. Once again, God bless you. Thank you for being here. We do as well have our Jackson shirts joining us via video. So give them all a hand. We're glad to have them join us as we really together dive into what, what do the scriptures have to say about prayer and fasting? And what does that mean for me? What are the miraculous results that can take place when God's people pray and they fast? So I, I, I text my mom on Saturday. I said, Mom, I hear that uh, we're going to get an ice storm. And the, the weather warning is saying that there will be, not maybe, there will be power outages. So just if, if you lose your power, give me a call. I'll come pick you up. We have a generator now at the house so we can keep the power going. And mom responds by saying, I'll just plan on still having power. <laughs> okay. That's a mom. They're actually not just power. It's actually thinking about even having more power. Well, more. how do you get more power? Well, she goes on to say, well, you know that where there's praise, there's power. I said, Mom, you've got to have power in your house. I mean, if the whole city went dark, Mom's going to be praising, and it seems like the lights are still going to be on. <laughs> Didn't we learn last week as we took a look at God's word that when King Jehoshaphat called an entire nation to pray and to fast— And they faced something that would be impassable, something that would be impossible. And in the midst of impossibility, God spoke. Don't you love it when God speaks in the middle of your impossibility? Yeah, God speaks in the middle of the impossibility. So God spoke and and said, hey, I'm going to take care of everything. And, And while they were heading out toward the army that they could not defeat by themselves, well, God had said, hey, you're going to go out, but you're not going to have to fight because I'm going to fight for you. Just go out there. So while they're going out there, say go out. out. It's really important this year that in your going out, there are miracles with your name on it. While they were going out there, King Jehoshaphat said, hey, believe in the Lord your God and you're going to be established. Believe in his prophets and you will succeed. It's like Jehoshaphat had to say, hey, just remember Like, I know we're going out, and it looks like we're going against what is impossible, but you've got to remember that with God, everything is possible if you will just believe in God. And then they did something really unusual. All of a sudden, they they decided, hey, we want to put at the front lines of this battle, a battle that God's going to fight, we want to put people that are going to sing in praise there. So I'm going to get some singers out in front. Isn't that unusual? And it wasn't like, let's get the singers out there so they get shot first. Well, that's not what they were doing. They were just saying, just get the singers out there. Why? Because there's power when we praise. They were so convinced God would do what he said he would do. We want to start praising him ahead of time and not wait until we see it. Do you know that on the other side of this word, unusual, There are miracles for you in 2020. It's on just the other side of what's unusual. If you will dare to do the unusual, you can expect the extraordinary. They dared to have unusual faith. And then they dared to do something extremely unusual, and that's to sing on their way to a battle. And it is 2 Chronicles 20, 22 that tells us at the moment, say at the moment. Yeah, at the moment they began to sing, God turned everything around for their good. So it's true that as we venture into this year and we do the unusual, hey, we too can expect the extraordinary. And I'm, I'm so expecting 
miracles to be released into your life, I'm already anticipating a line of people, a line, a line of stories of what God has done for you already this morning at the early service. Somebody said, already, we're not even done fasting yet, and I'm already seeing the answers begin to roll in. Isn't that good news? Yeah, I'm expecting the answers to your prayers to begin to roll in. Family members that, that need to be born again, they've been away from God, they're coming home, and I can't wait to hear about that fractured, broken families, being mended, restored, healed. I can't wait to hear that story. Sick bodies that have been revived and are now healthy and whole. Man, I can't wait to hear your story about that. I'm expecting miraculous provision and divine turnarounds all coming your way. So I'm expecting, hey, do you know that I believe this, we're supposed to live in a state of constant expectation. And I mean expecting good. Some people live in a constant state of expectation. They're just expecting something bad. They're expecting, I expect to not get this promotion. I expect to be overlooked again. I've been rejected so much that I expect they're probably going to reject me again. Hey, listen, you don't need to live your life like Winnie the Pooh's friend, Eeyore. Have you ever met somebody like Eeyore? Some are like, who is Eeyore? You don't want to know. If you don't know, just stay with that, right? Eeyore is like the Debbie Downer to the max, like nobody you want to be around because for them, everything goes bad. Nothing good comes my way. Hey, according to God's word, we should be expecting something good to come our way. Listen to the words of Jesus. If you need to get your expectation up just a little bit, Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 7, those who ask will receive. He said, come on, keep on asking, and you will receive. Wow, keep on seeking. The the one who keeps on seeking, they're going to discover. And that somebody who keeps on knocking, if you keep on knocking, the door will be open. I mean, there's like surety. There's like, this is absolutely going to happen. I have expectation that if I'm asking, I'm going to receive. If I'm seeking, I'm going to find. If I'm knocking, the door will be opened. Hey, this whole year, you're meant to live a life of constant expectation. Expect that miracles are indeed coming your way. Expect that God has something good coming your way, even when you don't see it yet. You can bust out in a thank you to God because you so believe in God. You believe in what he said that you're filled with expectation. I encourage you, do something unusual and join us in this fast. And also, I would ask you to join us on Wednesday night. Wednesday night is our prayer gathering here at the Hope. And I encourage you to come. You say, Pastor, I don't normally come. Perfect. Then it would be unusual for you. And if you do the unusual, you can expect the extraordinary. Oh, but Pastor Kev, I've got a busy week. Yep, I have, I have a busy week too. But I, I happen to believe there is power when God's people pray. I believe that when two or three are gathered in his name, like I believe that so I know as we gather together and as we pray and seek God, we can expect miracles to be released into our lives, our homes, our families, our church, and this whole community. And then on January, Wednesday, January 22nd, we have churches from all over the community that will gather with us. But I don't want just them here. I want you here. Let's fill this place and make it hard for them to find a spot. Can we do that? I'm expecting good things to come your way. Hey, we're going through the book of Romans right now. We've kind of paused at a point in Romans because we found this this word prayer and this attitude of expecting. We read this in Romans chapter 12, verse 12. Rejoice in our confident hope. This is how believers live. This is how we behave in God's house and in his family. If you're a follower of Christ, this is how Christians are to be. We rejoice in a confident hope, we're patient in trouble, and we keep on praying. We don't quit, we just keep on praying. I love the way the message says, it says, uh, be alert servants of the master, cheerfully expectant, don't quit in hard times, just pray all the harder. Isn't that beautiful? So what do we do? We keep on praying. And as we said last week, nobody keeps on praying unless they keep on expecting. 
and we're to live a life that we keep on expecting. We keep on praying because we keep on expecting a breakthrough. I keep on praying because I keep on expecting that God is going to come through. So I want to encourage you in this season of prayer and fasting, keep on praying. Some of you have had things you've prayed about, you've asked God for. It hasn't happened yet. Didn't seem to work out. I want to encourage you. Hey, listen, there's still a miracle for you. It may not have turned out the way you thought, but listen, God's not done with you. He is still a miracle working God. I encourage you, keep on praying and keep on believing. Keep on expecting. There's something unusual uh, that we can add to our prayers. Whoa. Whoa. I have no idea what that was, but the Lord really wanted you to wake some of you up. Hey, prayer! This is important. You were nodding off. He said, stop! So, this is so important that we add to our prayers fasting. You can't talk about the call to keep on praying without the biblical call to keep on fasting can't talk about prayer. Here's what you'll find. There's this, this beautiful combination throughout scriptures that you find, and that's prayer and fasting. And when you mingle prayer and fasting together, you can expect the extraordinary. When you do something as unusual as abstain from food for spiritual purposes, not forever, but for a season. I'm going to abstain from food for a season for the purpose of, for spiritual purposes, I mean, you can expect miracles. You can always expect there to be a whole trail of miracles that follow a season of prayer and fasting. Bill Bright said it this way, combining fasting with prayer can result in a spiritual atomic bomb that pulls down strongholds and releases the power of God in your life, in the life of your church, its pastor, its leaders, and its member. Members, we learn that fasting is talked more about in the scriptures than water baptism. And yet so many churches who believe in water baptism ignore this biblical practice called fasting. We know that Jesus fasted. We read in Matthew 6, Jesus said, when, not if, but when you give and when you pray and when you fast. So Jesus expected that people would fast. We know Jesus fasted for 40 days before he entered into his ministry A lady named Anna who was in her 80s. It says in Luke chapter 2 verse 37 that she lived lived out her days night and day, never leaving the temple, doing what? Praying and fasting. Isn't that interesting? The Apostle Paul, it says in Corinthians, that he was often found fasting. 2 Corinthians 11, 27. Leaders in Acts 13, it says that they were praying and fasting before they sent Paul and Barnabas. Great leaders of, throughout church history have so believed in the power of prayer and fasting. Leaders like John Kelvin, John Knox, Jonathan Edwards, Charles Finney, Andrew Murray, uh, John Wesley, who began the Methodist movement, he believed so much in the power of fasting, he would, he would call people to fast every, not just for 21 days at the beginning of a year, but say, hey, every Wednesday and Friday is a fasting day. And he would not even ordain ministers unless they would agree to fast on Wednesday and Friday. Derek Prince, speaking of the power of fasting, put it so well. He described fasting as a lesson that establishes who is the master and who is the servant. He said it well. Remember, your body is a wonderful servant, but a horrible master. But what fasting does is it it lines up. It puts in order the way things should be. The Apostle Paul said there's always this inner struggle between the flesh, our body, and our carnal selves, and the spirit. And we're supposed to be led by the spirit. So one of the things fasting does is say, hey, body, hey, flesh, you don't get to be in the driver's seat. You don't get to be the master, and so I'm going to put you in place during this season of prayer and fasting. So the question should never be if I should fast, but rather when And how should I fast? You know, there's a right way to do things and a wrong way to do things. According to the scripture, there's a right way to fast and there's a wrong way to fast. 
there's a way to fast that, that will bring about supernatural results into your life. There's also a way to fast that it won't do anything. Nothing good will ever be accomplished. So we want to learn, well, how do we fast in such a way that really could bring about supernatural results? To discover that, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. Verse 1. Shout with a loud voice of a trumpet blast. Shout aloud. Don't be timid. Tell my people Israel of their sins. Well, isn't that exciting right there? Like I should have advertised this. Hey, come, because we're going to tell you all about your sins. God told the prophet Isaiah, I want you to shout loudly and tell people about their sins. Interesting. Interesting. He goes on to say, yet they act so pious. They come to the temple every day, and they seem delighted to learn all about me. They act like a righteous nation that would never abandon the laws of its God. They ask me to take action on their behalf, pretending they want to be near me. Let's read on, verse 3. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We've been very hard on ourselves, and you don't even notice. I'll tell you why, I responded. It's because you're fasting to please yourself. Even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fast will, get you, will never get you anywhere with me. Now, there's a right way to fast. And there's a wrong way to fast. It's interesting the words that, that the Lord used to call out his own children. Did you notice this? He said, you seem, they seem, they act like they seem delighted to learn all about me. They act, God's calling them out as actors, pretenders. They act like a righteous nation that would never abandon me. They pretend they, want, they say, God, act on my behalf, and they pretend, they act like they want to be near me. Listen, we have to catch right away that, that God, God is not into to fakers. Like I said, if you're just going to go through the motions and try and act like you're something you're entirely not, it's not going to do you any good. I'm more concerned with who you really are, not who you pretend to be. I told you before, years ago, as a little kid, I'd, I'd come home, and uh, when, no one was, when I was home, my, my bedroom was in the basement, and it was dark down there, and it was kind of scary. And uh, so I'd come home when no one else is around. I thought, well, what if there's some random psycho in our basement? So I would walk downstairs talking to myself out loud on purpose, pretending that I'm like a martial arts expert. I would say things like, wow, whew, that karate practice was so hard that I, I can't believe I hurt that person so bad. I hope they're okay. <laughs> then I'd turn the lights on. Oh, it's all good. Everything's okay. Come back a different day. I wonder if there's a psycho down there. Whew, well, I got my black belt today. Man, today was a great day. Flip the lights on. Oh, no, I know nothing about karate. I was totally pretending to be something I'm entirely not. Like, all I know about karate is what I've seen on TV. Oh! Like, I'd, it's about, that's all I have. I was pretending. God said, hey, don't pretend to be something. You're entirely not. God always sees behind the mask. He always sees behind what's fake. And I love this. He loves his kids enough to say, hey, stop faking. Be the real thing. This tells us something significant about fasting. It tells us that we have to not only stop eating, we have to stop sinning. Don't just stop eating, stop sinning. Don't just stop eating, don't just stop eating food. It would be better if you would just stop sinning. And he goes on in verse 8 to describe what some of those sinnings are. He says in rather verse 9, uh, he says, Then after you stop being a faker... You will call on the Lord. He'll answer quickly. Then he says, remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious rumors. Isn't that interesting? 
So you, you, can't, you can't pretend to be all about me and all in love with me. The problem, he said, is, is it's, it's not that you don't love me. John Wesley called it, he would have called uh, the Israelites something like this, almost Christians. You know what an almost Christian is? Like they know all the right things. They are very sincere and they really do love God. They just don't want to have to love people. God, I really love you, but I can't stand them. God, I really do love you. I want to please you, but I just don't want to have to love them. So I want to point my finger at them. I want to talk about them. I want to spread, according to this, vicious rumors about them. And God says, no, that's not how you, that kind of fast will get you nowhere. Instead of just stop eating food, stop sinning. Have you ever met somebody who, who loves to point the finger? Have you ever heard somebody? I mean, you don't hear this. You just hear, I can't believe they did that. I don't think they're very spiritual. I think they have issues. Now, there's some people where they, they know enough to know, well, I shouldn't accuse an individual. Too personal. So instead, I'll just say things like, well, the church. You ever hear that one? Well, the church isn't doing this right. Well, the church isn't doing real. Well, I think the church is this. And whenever you hear that stuff, you have to recognize where that comes from. Revelations chapter 12, verse 10 says, it is Satan who is the accuser of, guess who? The church. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And he does that night and day, nonstop. That is his M.O. So if you ever hear a critical spirit from somebody else, or perhaps from yourself, You've got to pause and say, wait a minute, where's that coming from? That critical spirit, that judgmental spirit always comes from the accuser of the brethren who is Satan. Listen, I want to be known as the encourager, not the accuser. I want to be known as the somebody who's going to speak the best about somebody else. I would rather point, point the finger at myself than somebody else. In fact, if you rewind Isaiah from 58 back to Isaiah 6, you'll find Isaiah, this prophet who God said, go tell my people about their sins. Announce it loudly. Before that ever happened, first Isaiah in God's presence said, hey, woe is me. I am a sinful man. Like my lips aren't clean. God, I need you to clean me. There was a humility there. Not a judgmentalism. So, hey, if we're going to fast the way God wants us to fast, a way that actually can result in something good coming to you, your family, our church, our whole community, you got to not just stop eating, we have to stop sinning. Reading on verse 4 again, let's read that again. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fast will never get anywhere with me. You humble yourself by going through the motions of penance, you bowing your head like reeds bending in the wind. You dress in burlap and cover yourself with ashes. Is this what you call fasting? Just acting like you're sorry, acting like you're very humble. Do you really think this pleases the Lord? No. This is the kind of fasting I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry and give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives who need your help. Isn't that kind of weird you'd even have to say that? <laughs> now if you're hiding from relatives who need help, you need help. And yet, apparently, it was necessary for God to say these things. I don't want to fast when you're faking. I don't want to fast when you're acting like something that you're not. I just assume you rather repent, change your mind about where you've been at and start to head in a different direction. I don't want you to just stop eating but stop sinning. And I also don't want you to just stop eating. I want you to start loving 
I want you to start loving more. Yeah, don't just stop eating, but start loving. Listen, if you're going to stop eating food for a season, that means you're not going to buy as much food. Well, what should you do? Why not give that money to the poor? Why not, why not go find some clothes that you could give away to somebody else who would need some clothes? This is the time to, to love more. I encourage you, don't just stop eating. Start loving all the more. Like this is, this God said, here's what I like. I like when people stop oppressing. Don't oppress people. You know that word oppression, it, it gives a picture of a cracked vase. Somebody broken like a cracked vase. Man, I want you to help them. Don't be the one that breaks them. Be the one that heals them. I want you to set, get chains off of people. Don't be the somebody who's putting chains on people. I want you to be the people that are taking chains off of people. Did you know that your own bitterness can keep chains on people? Your own wanting vengeance. Your own self-righteousness can be putting chains on somebody else. And God said, hey, I want you to take those chains off of people, not be putting them on people. If you weren't here last week, you missed a, an amazing moment where Pastor Jeff shared about an, an opportunity he had in the grocery store when he saw a young lady who had a hat on, and on her hat it said Satan on her hat. And he could have just thought, well, that's really sad that this young lady Whatever that's about, that's just sad. Oh, God, help us. Our community really needs help. And he could have walked out thinking that. Instead, he saw somebody, I don't know their story, and neither did Jeff at that time, but, but somebody who, obviously, there's some oppression there. There's some chains there. And so in a moment, he just said, hey, God, what can I do? And in a moment, he decided, I'm gonna buy her groceries, and then he said some words. Listen, what she needed at the moment was not to be judged, but to be loved. What most people need is not to be judged. They need to be loved. So he chose, I'm going to love. And God says, that's the kind of fast I want. And so by a simple act of love, hey, can I buy your groceries? Yeah. In a simple act of love, and then after the groceries are bought, he said, you know what? Oh, you've probably heard a lot of people say things to you in the name of religion. Hey, I just want you to know that Jesus loves you. And with tears running down her face, she reached out her hand for a handshake. I'm just telling you, at that moment, chains were coming down. At that moment, oppressed people were being set free. The love of God sets people free. God says, that's the kind of fast I'm looking for. And listen, this is what, as a follower of Christ, if that's who you are, that's what we get to do. Through our prayers, we get to set captive people free. Through our love, we get to take chains. Hey, through our love, we should hear chains dropping on the people we get to be around. God says, that's the kind of fast I'm looking for. Don't just stop eating, stop sinning. Don't just stop eating, start loving. Start loving at a whole new level. Now quickly, the Isaiah gives us some now benefits. The Lord says, here's some benefits now of fasting in a way that pleases me. No pretending, no faking, being the real deal. Isaiah 58, this brings us now to verse 8. Then your salvation will come like the dawn. Say the word then. Yet yeah, whenever you read the word then in the Bible, you've got to back up and say, well, wh then what? What happened that made us say then? And it was a matter of what we had just talked about, that we're going to fast not as fakers. We're going to not stop just eating. We're going to stop sinning and start loving all the more. And if you do that, then your salvation will come like the dawn. Your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward. And the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Verse 9, then you will call and the Lord will answer. Yes, I am here. He will quickly reply. Remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious lies. Feed the hungry. Help those in trouble. Then your light will shine out from the darkness. And the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. So, Here's some miraculous things that take place when we fast in the way that God says, I want you to fast like this. Number one, you become a light in a dark place. 
Your light will break forth like the dawn. Have you ever been in a dark place and you wish you had a light? In our house, in our first house, the electricity didn't work well downstairs, and our laundry room was downstairs. And on top of that, we couldn't just flip a switch to turn the lights on at the top of the stairs. We had to walk all the way down the stairs in the dark, thumb our way around until we found a, a light, a lamp. And then we had to turn on that lamp just perfectly because if you didn't touch it just, just right, you would get zapped. A little electric. <laughs> but we not only had that, a friend was living with us for about a year, Sam Gibson. He had went to Florida, came back to the house, and he brought a crab with him. And the crab got loose. And the crab liked to hang out right by the wash machine. And so we'd walk downstairs in the dark. Am I going to get, am I going to find the crab? Or am I going to get zapped? I'm just saying, it's a lot better where you can just turn the light on. And God is saying, when you fast my way, hey, I'm going to turn the light on you. You're going to be like, like glowing in the dark. In the midst of darkness, you're going to glow with light. God said, I'm going to bright up your pathway. What a beautiful promise that God promises that he will turn on the light for us. Second, there's that promise of healing. Your wounds will heal quickly. The, the Hebrew word there gives a picture of a plant sprouting up quickly, that healing is going to begin to sprout up in you quickly. Some of you need a physical healing. Some of you have wounds on the inside, and you need to be healed there. God said, hey, when you fast when I'm calling you to fast, you can expect and plan on healing to come quickly to you. Also, there's a promise of divine guidance. Isaiah 58, 11 says the Lord will continually, rather will guide you continually. Giving you water when you're dry and restoring your strength. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. What a beautiful picture to, to say, God, I need you to guide me. Like, show me what's the right thing to do. What's the, what's the right way to go here? God says, hey, I promise when you fast my way, I will continually guide you. And I will, I will water you like a garden. You know, that's a picture of you just being watered for yourself. But when your life becomes like a spring, that means, man, I'm here for somebody else too. I have a blessing of overflow. I'm so blessed. I get to be a blessing to somebody else. There's the promise of divine protection. Your godliness will lead you. And the glory of the Lord will protect you, surround you from behind. This is a great picture of what happened to the Israelites when they were, and God was reminding them of this. In this verse we read in Isaiah that when Israel was stuck with the Red Sea here, that they could not pass in the Egyptian army back here. If you remember reading that story, you can read it in Exodus chapter 13 and 14, that it says God showed up, his glory showed up like a cloud, and all of a sudden that cloud, when the enemy came from behind, it just moved and went right behind them. Would you like some angelic and some supernatural protection in your life? Oh, absolutely. I want that for my children, grandchildren. I want that for you. And one of the rewards of fasting is supernatural divine protection over your life in your home. There's the blessing of prayers that are answered quickly. And then lastly, in verse 12, it says this, some of you, will rebuild deserted ruins of your cities. Then you will be known as a rebuilder of walls and a restorer of homes. You can become a restorer of people through fasting God's way. Every day, we pass people that are fractured, and they're broken, they're in chains, they are oppressed of the devil, Every day we have the opportunity to say, I want, I want to be known as not somebody who tears other people down. I want to be known as a somebody who's building other people up. I want to be known as the rebuilder and the restorer of lives. And it's a promise for those who will fast God's way. They can be a restorer of people. I want that for me and I want that for you too. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 1, 
All this began with, tell my people Israel of their sins. The only reason God ever wants to tell his kids about their sins is because he loves them. The only reason God ever wants to point out a sin or a wrong in somebody, whether that is, is, is Isaiah said specifically, you know, slandering, gossip, spreading rumors. The only, the only reason God will ever point that out, wrongly treating people in some way, he'll only point that out because he wants better for his kids. He says, hey kids, you're not going to get the rewards of fasting that you want and that you need if you keep on like this. So because I love you so much that I want you to, I want you to see your behavior begin to shift and make a change with that. And so it would be wrong this morning for us to read this in God's word and think, well, that was really good for those sinners. They really needed to hear that. Praise God. And I can think of five other people right now that should have heard that. If that's you, you needed to hear that this morning. Oh, the truth is, we all need to hear that. First John says, if you think you're without sin, you deceive yourself. The fact of the matter is that during fasting, physically with our bodies, toxins begin to come to the surface of our bodies. Things that are not good on the inside of us start to move out of us. You know, it's true too in fasting in the body of Christ. And Mount Hope is one expression of the body of Christ. That during a season of fasting, impurities, things that are not best or not good, needs to rise to the surface so it can be pushed out of the way and we can move on. And the Lord wants to do that in us this morning. Years ago, I sat on a beach in Florida and I watched a I found out it was a machine. I didn't know what it was called. I found out later it was called a beachcomber. And I really marveled because I watched this big machine go across the beach and it would pick up all the sand and then it would filter out. Somehow it knew how to filter, how to, how to let seashells back onto the beach, but how to keep a cigarette butt, how to keep a bottle, how to keep trash and remove that but leave the good stuff. And as I sat on the beach, I said, Lord, would you... Would you like a beachcomber sweep over me again today? Or anything that somehow, I don't even know how it would have got there, but if something got in me that's not good, would you just gently, out of your amazing grace, would you sweep over me? And would you get stuff out of me that shouldn't be there and stuff that really, on my own, I could never get it out of there anyway? But you could transform me some more today cause me to be made more and more into your image and your likeness. And I think it would be appropriate this morning that we do the same thing. We ask the Lord to do that in us. That's, hey, whenever you read about fasting in the Bible, you'll always find nearby this word repentance. It's a beautiful gift from God. It's something amazing, an opportunity God gives us. So you all close your eyes with me this morning. I want us to do two things. You're here this morning and you say, Pastor Kev, I need to, I know that I need to make my peace with God. I don't know that my sins are forgiven. It's not just that I see stuff in me. I don't know they've ever been forgiven. I need to make sure that I'm right with God. Come on, this is your, your very moment right now, your time to say, I'm making sure that things are right with me and God today. Sin always separates God from man, and only it is only faith in Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, what he did as a payment for your sin. It's believing what Jesus did for you that allows us to be adopted into God's great family. That's what causes our sins to be forgiven. So if you would say, Pastor Kev, pray for me. I need to know my sins are forgiven. Man, I want to pray a miracle prayer with you. Your sins get wiped out today. If that's you, I'm going to ask at the count of three you to shoot your hand up just as fast as you can. Are you ready? Without any delay. One, two, three. Go ahead, shoot your hand up. I want to see who that is. I'm going to pray with you today. In the main floor, in the balcony, just wave it at me. It'll help me see you so I can see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. How many more? Real quickly, just wave your hand at me. In the balcony, thank you so much. Thank you. I see that hand too. Thank you. Okay, let's do this. I'm going to ask everybody to stand to your feet. 
And for all those who raised their hand and perhaps you thought, man, I knew I should have raised my hand. Hey, you pray right now with me too. We're going to pray together. I want you to say this. Say, Father in heaven, I thank you for your son Jesus. I believe that he died, he was buried, and he rose from the dead. Jesus, you gave your life for me. So now I give my life to you. Everything that I am and all that I hope to be, I belong to you. I thank you, Jesus, that my sins are forgiven. I'm adopted into your family. And I have a brand new start in life that begins right now. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for praying with me. For all the rest of us, I want us to do one more thing. I think it's important during our time of prayer and fasting. You're already saved. You already know that you've been made right with God through faith in Christ. But somehow, there's still sin got in your life. Somehow you find yourself saying something you shouldn't have said, having an attitude you shouldn't have had. And I'm going to ask you, even as we, I had everybody gather last week, just as King Jehoshaphat said, I want the whole nation to gather because we're seeking God's face. I'm going to ask every one of you to come just as fast as you can, as quick, as close as you can to the front here. We're going to, as a family, all come together. We're going to take a few moments to ask God to, like a beach comber, to comb over our lives. I'm going to ask you to make that your prayer. It's got to come out of you, however it comes out in your words, right? This is a prayer for you. Say, God, I need you to clean. Would you clean me up some more, God? If you know there's stuff in you that you've seen, it's just say, hey, God, God, forgive me. I can't even believe that I said that, or I can't even believe I went there. I don't know how that got there, but I thank you, Lord, for getting that out of me. Come on, you begin to have those kind of prayers right now. Then I'll close this out in a couple moments. But you have those kind of prayers right now. Just ask the Lord, Lord, sweep over me. Sweep over me. God, I ask in the name of Jesus that you gently, by your amazing grace, sweep over us. Beautiful sweep of repentance and cleansing by the power of your Holy Spirit.
Father in heaven, I thank you that even at this moment, as you gently sweep over us, that you're gently washing us. Holy Spirit, you're so ever gently causing us to be made more and more into your image and likeness. That we can be children who look like their father. Thank you, God. Thank you for what you're doing deep on the inside of us. Lord, it's because of your amazing grace that we get to walk out of this place today choosing not just to stop eating, we're going to stop sinning. We're not just going to stop eating, we're going to start loving even more. And Lord, I pray that those that have been oppressed, it feels like their lives are cracked and broken, that they would be, even in this room right now, that they would be healed in the name of Jesus. I call for every chain that has been wrapped around them to come off in Jesus' name. God, let there be throughout this season of fasting waves and waves of massive deliverance and freedom. And Lord, make us containers of hope, carriers of your presence everywhere that we go. God, I ask this in the powerful name of Jesus, and now I speak it as a blessing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Love you. God bless you.